Welcome back to another episode of By Study and By Faith, where we take a look at critical thinking skills and see how they coincide with LDS theology and history. I'm Zach Wright, and we've got some great stuff to get into today. You can probably tell I'm in a new room today. This this is the setup is a little bit different. There's a couple of things that I'll get to at the end to explain why that is. We've got some really exciting stuff in the future, but what I wanted to do is kind of mix things up a little bit today. We're, instead of having announcements at the beginning, we're going to have them at the end, and some of the stuff is just going to be a little bit different. But I think we're just going to launch right into today's topic, which is the Gospel for Mormons. So, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we, we often run into people who criticize us for our beliefs. We have a very long history of it. I served my mission in a place where I was often criticized by general Christians who wanted me to who wanted me to let go of the faith that I've grown up with and instead and instead embrace this this concept of a quote unquote true biblical Jesus. Now, for us as Latter-day Saints, that may sound kind of confusing at first. But it's actually a really common phenomenon for Christians to, to claim that we, as members of the church, aren't true Christians, that we're not true believers, and as a result, we're going to be going to hell. I've been told that multiple times. However, in my experience, a lot of the reasoning behind why they claim we are going to hell, or why we don't embrace the biblical Jesus, tends to employ reasoning and information that does not coincide with reality, hence what brings us to our discussion today. In order to explore some of the presuppositions of those who who challenge the restoration or those who would like to, you know, be, for many people who on my mission would challenge me in my faith, I, I wanted to focus this episode on a pamphlet called The Gospel for Mormons, which was produced by... Um, an Arizona-based church called Apologia Church, their, and, and their pastors, Jeff Durbin and James White. They are denominational Baptists, and w with kind of a um, reformed Calvinistic idea of salvation on the side, that's going to come up a little bit later. But their pastors are known for quite frequently attacking against LDS theology, and their, their claims in this specific pamphlet focus on three different things. First, it's the idea that we don't believe in a God who is the God of the Bible. Second, we believe in a different Jesus, and because we believe in a different Jesus, we consequently can't be saved. And third, we have a bad idea of grace and faith, and that w they believe that we reject this concept of free grace and so we consequently also will not be saved. So again, from these ideas, they state that we as members of the church cannot be saved. They've produced a number of tracts and pamphlets explaining why they label us in this way as kind of these non-Christians, these non-believers, so to speak. So we're going to go through the entire pamphlet today, and as we do so, we're going to be using some of the skills that we've learned throughout the, the, the course of this series so then we can try and get to the bottom of what's going on, where some of the differences that between their beliefs and our beliefs are, and we're going to see if they are justified in their attacks against the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Just a couple of logistical things. Uh, the written form of this discussion, uh, we're going to be having the, their text be in red, my text being in black, and the references are going to be a little bit different. I've also tried my best to simplify some of the terminology that they use and what I will use in a way that's easily digestible and can help foster really good discussion. With all of that in mind, let's proceed with my response to the Gospel for Mormons. The pamphlet reads the following way. It starts, The Gospel for Mormons. And they write, The Mormon Church teaches a message that sounds so similar to Christianity, but it is fundamentally a different gospel that cannot save. 
So it's a common misunderstanding, if, in, if not at this point in our history, an, an intentional misrepresentation of, of those associated with, apology church, to call the church the, the Mormon church. Many who are hostile to the church also tend to do the same thing. So again, we are the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which I will shorten to the Church of Jesus Christ or the Church as the context demands. I don't really care how people first hear our names, Jesus, Jesus himself was called by many different names, and the church he founded wasn't really called by a specific name back in that time anyway. It would have been weird if it was called by a specific name, is my understanding. I just think it's a little bit interesting though that this pamphlet reiterates the same kind of hostility as those who labeled the saints in Antioch Christians or Christ worshippers in derision. And it's interesting that those who claim to be, who claim allegiance to the Christ of the Bible also adopt the tactics of the people who attacked Christ's church. The idea that these pastors refuse the basic requests of the people and the members of our church to call the church what it's actually supposed to be called already indicates a lack of respect that makes me a little bit wary of what their motivations are. The gospel, of course, is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It's the fact that Jesus Christ came, he died for us on the cross, and on the third day he rose again. And the LDS scriptures, of course, support that fully. We see that in the Doctrine of Covenants, uh, 3 Nephi 27. Uh, it's alluded to in the Articles of Faith. And there really, in this manner, there really is no contrary gospel that's taught by the Church of Jesus Christ today. Joseph Smith is said to have taught, quote, The fundamental principles of our religion are the testimony of the apostles and prophets concerning Jesus Christ, that he died, was buried, and rose again on the third day, and ascended into heaven, and all other things which pertain to our religion are only appendages to it. So when asked by those not of our faith, th th this should be our response. We should ask them, what is the gospel? We should turn the question back on them and try and have a discussion as to what the gospel truly is. But let's continue with the pamphlet. They say, Mormonism began with a lie. The lie was that Heavenly Father came to Joseph Smith and told him not to join any church because they had it all wrong. All their creeds were an abomination and all denominations were corrupt. So Joseph told the world that God had told him that the Christian church had fallen away and it needed to be restored. And this is where things kind of get interesting for me because this is, this is an interesting claim which presupposes that religious claims are subject to some kind of objective criteria that would identify them as being true and that a person might lie about that being true. And if this claim would really just have to be kind of an opinion based on perspective, unless those associated with apology have some way to affirmatively prove or disprove Joseph Smith's claims made in the Joseph Smith history respecting his interactions with God. I, I, I don't know how they could label that as a lie. We can't prove that Joseph did or did not, so we can't prove that Joseph was lying about it. And again, we go back to this idea that the claim that all churches that existed were wrong is, objectively speaking, an opinion, not a misstatement of fact that would form the basis of a lie. Representing as a lie someone's admitted religious beliefs cannot be other than the product of deceit, lacking context. Just as apologia, if they accept the possibility of living prophets and additional scripture consistent with the claims of Jesus and Paul. You might get a response that's a little something like this. Um, when you say modern revelation, what do you mean? Well, we believe that God continues to follow the pattern that he followed in, in the biblical text, namely by revealing himself through prophets. In short, other churches chose to reject the concept of divine messengers, which was a hallmark of the original church established by God. Our belief is that such practices and others needed to be restored. Are they claiming this wasn't the case? If so, why? And the problem is they never really explain. This leaves us kind of in the dark and it leads to this idea that we're kind of talking past each other. But we'll keep 
we'll keep going with the, the pamphlet. They continue to say that this is a lie because 2,000 years before Joseph came along with this revelation, God said that he would build his church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, this interpretation causes some problems for their position, not only logically because of their reliance on doctrines in the Protestant Reformation, more on that in a minute, but because what this tract is extrapolating is a translation variation that doesn't align the true meaning of what the Biblical Greek states. In the original Greek, this passage in Matthew 16, 18 does not say the gates of hell, as this argument claims. Rather, it's it says this, and I'm going to put up a Greek phrase up here. It's I believe it's pronounced kepele athu, which roughly translates to the gates of Hades. Most modern translations render this passage in this way, and the fact that Pastor Durbin reads Greek and neglects to mention this important nuance is equally disconcerting for me. Hades was universally understood then as the place where spirits go after this life making this phrase here a direct reference to physical death. If you don't believe me, consider the following reference that links death with Hades from the Wisdom of Solomon, which was written about a century before the Book of Matthew, allegedly. Quote, For neither herb nor poultice cured them, but it was your word, O Lord, that heals all people. For you have power over life and death. You lead mortals down to the gates of Hades and back again. As we can see, even ancient sources seem to make some kind of connection between Hades and death. And we can even consult other elementary co commentaries on this matter, such as this. The Gates of Hades is a familiar ancient expression for the realm of the dead, both in Greek literature and in the Greek translation of the biblical Gates of Sheol, or death. Even martyrdom cannot stop God's plan. And the Net Bible Commentary also suggests that the gates of Hades be understood as the power of death. Did physical death conquer the church? Theologically speaking, no, because thanks to Jesus Christ, all will be resurrected as he was. Already this passage is being stripped from its context and exegetical meaning by the argument presented in this pamphlet. And I can even turn the question back onto Apologia Church here. So what is or which is the church that the gates of Hades will not prevail against? What were its structures and teachings? Are these pastors claiming that the Protestants, and especially those who are Calvinist or Reformed, adheres completely to those structures and teachings, such as, but certainly not limited to, baptismal regeneration, apostolic leadership, salvation, scriptural interpretation? Can these pastors demonstrate Protestant theology such as sola fide or optional baptism or any, anything like that has existed as far back as Christ's ministry? Who would they consider to be a proto-Protestant, so to speak, before the 15th and 16th centuries? If we ask questions about what they really mean, I, I don't think that they really have great answers for that. The pamphlet continues, in Jude 3, we are told to earnestly contend for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints, already. So my question immediately becomes, where are they getting already from? I could be mistaken, but I don't see that word in this verse, in any translation, really. Yeah, the once for all delivered yeah. to the saints doctrine, that, that, that doctrine. Yeah, the that once and all delivered to the states. Yeah. Which is what? Well, you, you don't believe that it was once for all delivered wait, to the saints. Wait, where is that found Jude. in the New Testament? All right. Jude. So Jude is doing what by saying that? What, what do you mean? I believe he's saying. What, what, what that, is? What that, do you believe is that, actually what, the meaning of that passage? That, that the words that, the words that have been written by these prophets, the true prophets, right. were the the once for all delivered to the saints doctrine. And as soon as the last prophet died. That okay. that canon okay. ended. So so it so it can't mean that that all of the texts are the once and all delivered because Jude is not the last text of the New Testament. No, I, no, I, right. I, no, I agree. And there were still yeah. actively yes, active authorized prophets, authors. Active, yes, right. yes. So Agreed. the once and all delivered can't be a closure of God's word because it was still yet to be written. Certainly, yes, but I, but again, right. so, it, it's, so the it's author of the Jude prophets, is not so. presupposing the a one time. This is the thing. So your your understanding of the context 
is objectively wrong because Jude can't be referring to a once in time Genesis to Revelation because that composition didn't exist at the time Jude was written. But you assume that that's what he meant and you're using it in that context. And when you say that I'm lying, that is a lie because you are misrepresenting something you objectively know is false. What is true? As seen here, the usage of this passage is, is frankly absurd in this context. Not only would their interpretation presume to close the canon with these verses in Jude, but another problem arises. As LDS scholar John Tivetnis points out, that Abraham was taught the gospel according to Galatians 3.8. So is it is Jude correct in saying then that the gospel was only delivered once and for all people? If the gospel is never to be revealed again, then what use is there for the angel in Revelation 14, 6 through 7 to come deliver the gospel? Understanding the verse and the way that they're using it provides conflicts and contradictions in the Bible. I mean, they can do that, but is that an idea that they're willing to concede? Do they want to say that the Bible contradicts itself? I think you'll find that the answer that they provide most often is no. The pamphlet continues, The promise given to us in Daniel 7, 13-14 is that the Messiah would come and that he would have a kingdom that would never be destroyed. Speaking of that promised kingdom, Jesus said that in Mark 1 that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. So let's say for a minute that their interpretation of this passage is accurate. Uh, and is what Daniel meant for a minute. Seeing as Daniel 7, 16 through 22 seems to indicate that the time of spreading the gospel occurs before the judgment, who is to say that the kingdom of God would be done rolling forth until that time? That alleged apostasy wouldn't even really affect this interpretation of Daniel's prophecy, seeing as God, all God would have to do is make sure that his kingdom was done rolling forth before that time, which we as Latter-day Saints would fully accept. With this in mind, where, do, where does this passage exclude the chance of apostasy in the meantime? The pamphlet follows, Scripture tells us that the Messiah has been seated on his throne, he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He brought the kingdom already. Joseph Smith was 2,000 years behind. And my response to that would be, Jesus brought it, we, we fully accept that, and people consequently rejected it. And Jesus restored it the, the, again the same way that he establishes and puts forth doctrine in, in the biblical text, by calling messengers, prophets and apostles. I, I, I suppose you guys accept the New Testament as scripture. Certainly. Yep. Right. And so so with that, you know, you've got the Greek manuscripts being appended to the Hebrew texts mm -hmm. at a later date by presumably authorized people to do that. So the authority is vested in the individuals to, to reveal more of God's nature, his understanding. Seeing as God has called both messengers in both the Old and the New Testaments, why would God just stop doing that in our day? The burden of proof would be on those using this argument against the church to demonstrate why this is no longer the case if they are just using the biblical texts. The pamphlet follows, that's why this really is about God and his gospel. We are told, before me was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. In the, the pamphlet, they cite Isaiah 43.10 and Isaiah 44.6 to support this. Okay, so before me, there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. So right off the bat, this is just a, a misrepresentation of what the, the biblical texts seem to indicate when you study them more closely. So it's pretty well established in this point in biblical scholarship that the Jews did believe in the existence of multiple gods. But let's just break down the wording of these verses for a minute. The phrase, none else besides me, is a Hebrew figure of speech to mean the best of them all. The There are several verses that, that help kind of support this idea, so we can consider how Isaiah 47, 8 uses this phrase, quote, therefore, Babylon, hear now this, 
Thou art given to pleasure, thou that art given to pleasures, that dwellest carelessly, that sayest in thine heart, I am, and none else beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. Boom. Or even we can look at Zephaniah 2.15, which says, This is the rejoicing city, Nineveh, that dwelt carelessly, that said in her heart, I am, and there is none beside me. How has she become a desolation, a place for beasts to lie down in? Every one that passeth by her shall hiss and wag his hand. Now, are these anthropomorphized cities claiming to be the only cities in existence? Not at all. Rather, these cities of Babylon or Nineveh are just claiming that they're the best or the most powerful. This would be the, the equivalent of our day as saying, there is no team besides the Seahawks. Of course, there are other football teams besides the Seahawks, but what they're saying is that this is the best of them all, that the only real team, the one that is the most powerful, the most supreme, is the Seahawks. It's, it's a little interesting if we try to use that in our today's context, but as we were able to see, if we put these scriptures and these phrases and these ideas in their proper historical area and in their exegetical context, we find that they are saying something different than how these pastors are representing these passages now. To support this argument further, we can even turn to other ancient documents. So the Thanksgiving scroll, which is numbered among the Dead Sea Scrolls, affirms this point and offers clarification to the nature of the ancient Israelite belief. And I think it also accurately reflects the grammatical argument I'm trying to make. Now it reads, See, you are the prince of the gods and the king of the glorious ones, lord of every spirit ruler of every creature. Apart from you, nothing happens, and nothing is known without your will. There is no one besides you. No one matches your strength. Nothing equals your glory. There is no price on your might. And as we can read here, we have God being represented as being the greatest among all the Elohim, and yet being told that there is no one besides you. Again, even if we were to reject these passages as being non-biblical, the grammatical argument still stands. With this information in mind, how do these verses demonstrate conclusively that a belief, that, uh, a belief and idea that there was only one God in existence? Clearly, when we study these ancient texts, a different message is being given. The pamphlet continues, But Joseph Smith disagreed. He said, We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and will take away and do away the veil so that you may see. You have got to learn how to be gods yourselves and to be kings and priests to God, the same as all gods have done before you. Now, the historical practice here is to go back to the original sources, and that is the original documents given by Willard Richards, William Clayton, Wilford Woodruff, and Thomas Bullock. None of them say verbatim what uh, these pastors are claiming Joseph Smith said, and if you go back and study them, you'll find some actually very interesting differences between them. There's a reason the King Follett discourse has not been canonized. Even so, and that Let's also put aside the fact that even a new, a few general authorities in the past have seemed to veer away from this idea that God had a God. This concern is still predicated on the idea that the teach and that that teaching that multiple gods exist is fundamentally incorrect, which, as I've been able to show, still needs to be proven by them. They haven't finished proving their point in a way that would make this part of their argument a problem. In other words, their premises don't support the conclusion, and so the conclusion doesn't stand. These pastors continue, He, God, is not a created being. This goes against everything God says who he is. In Deuteronomy 6, he tells us that he's the only God and the only God that has ever been. So, again, I go back to my, my previous arguments, how if we go back to ancient Israelite texts, we find a different story than what these pastors are communicating. But to prove the point more fully that I have made, that these, this idea of like strict monotheism is what they believed, I, I would like you to consider this quote made by a study Bible from the Jewish Publication Society. Quote, 
Many modern readers regard the Shema, or Deuteronomy 6.4, which is what these pastors are quoting, as an assertion of monotheism, a view that is anachronistic. In the context of ancient Israelite religion, it served as a public proclamation of exclusive loyalty to Yahweh as the sole Lord of Israel. The verse makes not a quantitative argument about the number of deities, but a qualitative one about the nature of the relationship between God and Israel. Almost certainly, the original force of the verse, as the medieval Jewish exegetes noted, was to demand that Israel show exclusive loyalty to our God, Yahweh, but not thereby to deny the existence of other gods. In this way, it assumes the same perspective as the first commandment of the Ten Commandments, or the Decalogue, which, by prohibiting the worship of other gods, presupposes their existence. And this, of course, makes sense. After all, didn't God just finish saying that we shouldn't put any other gods before him? And back in Exodus 20, verse 3, again implying that the Israelites believed in the existence of other gods. And I would challenge Pastor Durbin and Pastor White to refute the argument itself instead of dismissing it as quote-unquote liberal scholarship. And that's something they've tried to do in the past. Now, he attempts to go after Deuteronomy 6.4, um, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone, is what he quotes there. He says this, The Shema is often cited as an evidence of strict monotheism. However, most biblical scholars agree that the Shema is not, under the, and not about the number of God, but instead is about how Yahweh is the only God with whom Israel is to have a covenantal relationship. Quickly. Yeah, once, once the Mormons at BYU and up in Salt Lake and Provo started realizing that they could use liberal Christianity uh, against those who were evangelizing Muslims. What they did not realize is that they put directly into the vein of Mormonism a straight track to its own destruction. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing this today. Well, it's not just Isaiah 43. I mean, we could go to Deuteronomy 6, the Shema. Yeah. Here yeah. is the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I mean, I, I don't, I don't think, uh, Sorry, which, I, which, I, I, which means, which Echad means unity. And so, um, Shema Israel Adonai, mm -hmm. Elohim Adonai Echad. I mean, that's the Shema. Um, with respect to that, I mean, what, what are you thinking that that's meaning? Uh, the plain meaning of what? the Lord our God, the Lord is one, means that there is one eternal Yahweh, well, creator the, of heaven the, and earth. That's, and that's the problem, Kylie. There is no plain meaning because you're talking about an ancient Hebrew document. You're not talking about a 21st century creation. So Certainly, but meaning, you would believe... Plain meaning you, within a Hebrew context would not be that because they, they existed in a polytheistic milieu. So the idea that there's only one God in existence is foreign to those texts historically. Why would this interpretation of the Old Testament be incorrect? Another refutation of this is provided by Paula Fredrickson in the Bible Review. It, it writes, or it reads, quote, in, anti in antiquity, all monotheists were polytheists. No ancient monotheist was a modern monotheist. Divinity expressed itself along a gradient, and the high god, be he pagan, Jewish, or Christian, hardly stood alone. Lesser divinities filled the gap, cosmic and metaphysical, between humans and God. These quotes should do for now, but to prove that I'm really trying to be honest about this, here's James White uh, saying exactly what I'm saying, how the vast majority of scholars seems to agree on this idea that God was not the only God in existence, or at least that's not how the Israelites viewed it. Yeah, it's interesting how you did define biblical scholars. Uh, it, it, when it comes to Old Testament scholarship today, uh, in the majority of seminaries, uh, I would say the vast majority of them uh, no longer believe in biblical monotheism they, because of their view of the Old Testament. Um, but sadly, we do need to recognize that if you go to uh, the place that I warn people about is the most dangerous uh, place for a, a, a Christian spiritually. It's called a Christian bookstore. Yeah. Um, if you don't realize as you walk down those those aisles, uh, you need to view those aisles as filled with coiled snakes, uh, especially not just when you're walking down the Joel Osteen aisle, not when you're walking down the shack aisle. It will be an entire 
uh, aisle uh, after the movie comes out. It will be a shack aisle. Yes. Uh, it, it will be. Um, that's a whole other topic. Um, but uh, when you go to the biblical commentary section, that's when they are really poisonous vipers. Because once they strike, the poison may be slow, but it is almost always fatal. Be I think I've made, I, I think I've beaten a dead horse at this point, so I'll just continue. The, uh, the Bible teaches, so th this is back to the pamphlet, the Bible teaches plainly that there is only one God, and he eternally exists as three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So my, my response to that would be, where does it plainly say that he, your God, exists as one God in three persons? There's not a singular text in the Bible that states this. You're saying things that are just factually untrue. And, and they're not, it's not whether they're an objective standard or not. They're just factually untrue. So, for example, at no place in anywhere in the biblical text does it define God as a being comprised of three personages. And if, you, it, if you have a passage that states that, please show it to me. Yeah, Objectively, does, does, where's the passage that says that? Yeah, so there's no one singular passage that says God I, is one I being in three persons. It's a pamphlet continues, when John 1 says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, it is speaking of Jesus, to which I would just respond, yes. That's okay. Uh, the pamphlet then continues, we are told that Jesus created everything in existence, and without him, nothing has come into being that came into being. Jesus is God who took on flesh. John 1.14 goes on to tell us that God took on flesh and he dwelt among us. The one and only true God, in the person of Jesus Christ, the creator of all things, came into his own creation and took on flesh. He is not a created being. So, first off, I, I, the LDS Church does not teach that Christ was a created being. God and all of God's spirit children are eternal and have always existed, as per D&C 93. Except Yahweh is the only true and living God that, that was not created, no beginning, no end. Okay. I guess here's where we, where you got, look, uh, do you believe Yahweh was created? No. Latter-day Saints don't believe in creatio ex nihilo, so we couldn't believe that. So, um, just, I, I guess, flesh that out a little bit more. I know, I know that y'all don't, y'all don't believe in creation from nothing yeah, fle flesh that out a little bit more um where did does yahweh come from he doesn't come from anywhere he just has always existed where do you get that from the biblical text i'm sorry where do you get that from the biblical text where do you get the idea that they were created out of nothing how do you, what? How do you know that you've always existed i think is what he's asking yeah because there's no there's no reason to determine otherwise the default is i exist now why would i it's, believe that i turned into existence at one point in being that's pure assumption Right, just like creatio ex nihilo is not explicated anywhere in the biblical text, but you probably believe it anyway. And even the King Follett sermon that they cited earlier, and this is from the very version that they are reading from when they got that specific quote, affirms this fact when it says, quote, I am dwelling on the immortality of the spirit of man. Is it logical to say that the intelligence of spirits is immortal, and yet it has a beginning? The intelligence of spirits has no beginning, neither will it have an end. Close quote. With this in mind, how does this aspect of LDS theology contradict John 1.3 and other creation passages about Jesus? After all, John 1.3 in most translations is rendered as God creating everything that was made. If we were not made, then how does this passage contradict LDS theology? It is true that we believe that God is our Father. He organized and formed our spirit bodies, and I would rightly classify that as a type of creation. That being said, that tenet of our belief does not counteract the idea that our intelligences have always existed. Everything that makes us, us, has always existed, according to our beliefs. And in this matter, we have both been created and also have always existed. So it's kind of like we get the best of both worlds, if you think about it. They would need to unequivocally prove creation from nothing, or creatio ex nihilo, to counteract the Elias position on this. But the, the pamphlet continues, He is not the spirit offspring of Heavenly Father and one of his goddess wives, which is what Mormonism teaches. 
and it's interesting, they cite the messages of the first presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ to Latter-day Saints. And I find that to be interesting because I, you know, I, I, took, I took the liberty of finding this book and I took a picture of the page in question. I'll put it up so that people can see it. Now, it does in fact refer to the concept that Jesus Christ is the literal Son of God. And it, it cites Brigham Young's comments on the matter to support this. It does not, however, affirm any kind of polygamy in the heavens, nor does it imply that Jesus is the offspring of said polygamy. To help kind of demonstrate this, that there's been a variety of opinions on this, we can even turn to the idea that the church publicly condemned Orson Pratt's magazine, The Seer, when he tried to propagate the idea that, among other things, God had multiple wives. And more can be said about that in particular, but does that sound like a resounding affirmation among leaders or even the church as a whole regarding this doctrine? Can they confidently state that this is what Mormons believe in the sense that all of us believe it? Even so, the pamphlet proceeds by citing uh, Colossians 1, 16 through 17, which reads, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. They continue, Jesus created all things. He is not Lucifer's brother. He is the creator of Lucifer. Now, I also found this to be kind of confused. I, I found this argument to be a little bit confusing, not because I don't see what they're trying to say, but this that the fact that this argument contradicts the argument they were trying to make back when they cited Isaiah 43.10. As they state, if Satan was created by Jesus Christ and Paul is correct in calling him a theos, uh, the Greek term meaning God, and that's exactly the, the term used to describe Satan, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Uh, wouldn't that contradict the argument they just made that God is the only true deity in existence and that no other gods exist? Put another way, previously they said that there was no other god in existence, but Paul says that Satan, or Lucifer, is a god. He is a theos. And so it's almost like by, by claiming that God created Lucifer, who is described as being a god, seems to be contradicting what they said before. And before anyone tells me that this isn't what Paul meant, I'll remind them that even older sources like Thayer's Bible, Bible lexicon states that Theos is used for whatever can in any respect be likened to God or resembles him in any way. And that the same Greek term using the same conjugation is used to refer to the true God in just a few verses later. In other words, in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Lucifer is referred to as a theos, or a god, and God the Father, or God, is referred to as a theos. Elohim, or the term Elohim, is used in a similar way in the Old Testament, and I've already discussed, in part, the ancient Israelite beliefs on this matter. The argument here is that Satan is a lesser god, one that isn't ultimately sovereign, but considered to be a god nonetheless. And that actually lines up rather well with the original conception of Satan in the Hebrew Bible. Consider how one non-LDS scholar put it. The sons of God are divine, spiritual beings that rule on Yahweh's behalf. The Hebrew phrase sons of X means that the sons is the same essence as X, so sons equal X. These sons of God are part of the divine council of Yahweh. They serve as his council, representative, and host. So, in other words, sons of God, including the original conceptualization of Hasatan or Satan, was the idea that he had, that he was the same essence as God the Father, or God. Uh, this scholar then continues to cite Job chapter 1 to prove this point saying that the figure Satan used to be a member of the Divine Council. And I'll use a translation that I think shows this point better. That's the ESV. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. 
After citing the scripture, the scholar continues, the Hebrew word for Satan, for the Satan, or Satan, meaning adversary, is always translated as adversary, except for in Job, with no, and, and they, they provide no real context or theological evidence for it. All other times the Hebrew word for Satan appears, it is transla translated as the noun adversary or accuser. And so this is a little bit technical, but what the scholar is basically saying is that Satan, or the accuser, on God's behalf, was initially understood in Hebrews thought as being a member of the sons of God, who were the same essence as God. They were given authority by God to rule over nations, and ultimately were under God's power. So while they are the same essence of a God, uh, the Tetragrammaton, or Yahweh, was considered to be above them. When we take these ideas for what they were, any historical argument that Paul is only metaphorically referring to Satan as being like a god but not really one in essence would be based on assumptions in light of the previously cited sources. And yet this doesn't contradict any claims in the Bible uh, or any claims that the biblical texts make about God's superiority. Though the Bible clearly teaches that other gods do exist, it all makes clear that makes it clear that Yahweh is absolutely sovereign over these gods as totally unique and incomparable. Therefore, under this line of logic, either Pastor Durbin and Pastor White must accept that the Bible contradicts itself, or accept that this verse is saying something else. There's more that can be said about this passage not being monotheistic, but I think this tangent has been long and complicated enough already, so I'll move on. Let's go back to the idea that they're challenging the idea that Jesus and Lucifer are brothers. And in case anyone wanted some other quotes to think about, let's consider what some of these er what some early Christians had to say when commenting on the Greek translation of the Old Testament, rendering of what was now known as Psalm 110. Note whom they refer as coming out of the womb after Jesus. Quote, the womb of the Lord, the hidden recess of deity out of which he has brought forth his son, in the psalm, out of the womb before Lucifer, I have borne thee, the son. Listen to the voice of the father to the son, before Lucifer I have begotten thee. He who was begotten before Lucifer himself illuminates all. A certain one was named Lucifer, who fell, for he was an angel and became a devil. And concerning him, the scripture said, Lucifer, who did arise in the morning, fell. And why was he Lucifer? Because, being enlightened, he gave forth light. But for what reason did he become dark? Because he abode not in truth. Therefore wilt thou give them up, until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth? Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. For in thee was born the prince begotten before Lucifer, whose birth from the Father is before all time. Now, I'll be the first to admit that the tradition behind these texts is tricky. I understand that. But these quotes clearly indicate that they believed that Jesus and Lucifer were begotten from the same womb. Would you deny that these early bishops, leaders, and apologists were Christians for believing that Lucifer was begotten of the Father after Jesus Christ was? How would their teachings differ from LDS conceptualization of how Jesus and Lucifer were brothers, so to speak? The pamphlet continues. This is important because the Mormon Church teaches a message that sounds so similar to Christianity, but is fundamentally a gospel that cannot save. It teaches another Christ, and that is a Christ that cannot save you. Again, you're, you you guys are very zealous. I Look, I applaud you. For I'm not zealous. Being zealous, zealous for what? Zealous for for a false god. Okay, it, it, yeah, and you're saying false god. I assume you have some objective criteria because of your objective standard. But Certainly. why your god is a false god? What, why Other your god is your a false opinion. god? No, so no, no, far, no, all you've stated is an opinion. We what you just said it. is true. That if somebody, if, I, I would say that right now you, you are following after a false god. But that does not mean I would never assume, Travis, that you. I would never just say that, Travis, you will spend an eternity in hell, because I don't know if you want to be elect or not. I do believe so. that um, that you de are destined for hell. 
with all due respect, according to their conceptualization of how they're saved, their soteriology, the only person ultimately responsible for the people who aren't saved is God. Why? Because according to them, God creates every aspect of us, including our desires and abilities and controls and and of course he controls the wills and occurrences leading up to everything that has happened or will happen to us. The burden of proof is on them to explain why God created people in such a way where they would almost have no choice but to disobey, or as John Calvin taught, be willed to disobey, and then punish the people that he created for doing exactly what he designed and willed them to do. Again, if I am or if anyone else is misunderstanding their positions, I openly invite their correction. But the natural conclusions that are drawn from Calvinism, creation from nothing, and an unknowable God seem, I don't know, disconcerting to me. They're, they're, they, don't, they don't seem like the kind of loving God you would expect to have. The pamphlet, we'll, we'll pick up right here. The pamphlet says, it's a Christ that is not found in scripture. And Jesus says in John 14, 6, that he is the way, the truth, the life, and no man comes to the Father except through him. So, the Trinity, as, you know, the, as they understand it, is a concept that is foreign to the biblical texts as well. So, for example, Greek terms like homoousis, which is found in the Nicene Creed, meaning one in substance, and that term was later developed to mean consubstantial, meaning that they are the same substance, they are one being in the same side. It's the kind of the concept of the modern trinity. So that modern concept of the trinity aren't, it isn't found in the biblical texts to describe God. It's just not. You can't find concepts of these words, or even the words themselves, being used to describe the nature of God and his relationship with Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost. This argument about something being absent from scripture comes across as somewhat hypocritical. The pamphlet continues that Jesus is the only way to have peace with God, which we as Latter-day Saints would absolutely agree with. But the pamphlet says that Mormonism teaches a different Christ. So my question would put back to them would be, what version of Christ are we talking about? If we're talking about the Bible's version, then I would say that I've, at least so far in my response, that that's the version I've been working off of so far. I've demonstrated that the verses that they've cited don't support their arguments or their conclusions when scrutinized on a historical or exegetical level. And honestly, I, I don't blame these, these pastors. I'm not saying they're bad people for making these claims. I, I disagree with them, and I think that I have sound reasons for disagreeing with them. But most of the problems they have are with the are with the arguments themselves. It's not with them per se. Still, they have to demonstrate how our our Jesus stands contradictory to anything that the biblical texts teach about him. Did we not just spend an entire year studying the New Testament? where we focused exclusively on the life of Jesus Christ and his gospel and his immediate disciples? The pamphlet claims that the, the church, quote, actually t tells people that you can, through obedience to laws and principles of the gospel, move your way through exaltation to become a god or goddess of your own planet, like the god of this earth did, and hardly anything could be further from the truth, close quote. And... I don't think that this argument fairly or accurately represents LDS faith at all. I've already talked about how we're no, under no obligation to assume that God the Father was a human being like us. The LDS Church has never taught that strict obedience earns our salvation. Instead, verses of the contextual LDS scripture teach that, quote, I say if you should serve him with all your whole souls, yet ye would be unprofitable servants. That's from Mosiah 2.21. Uh, Mosiah 13.28 reads that, And moreover I say unto you that salvation doth not come by the law alone, and were it not for the atonement which God himself shall make for the sins and iniquities of his people, that they must unavoidably perish, notwithstanding the law of Moses. 
Alma 25.16 says it very explicitly, where it says, Now they did not suppose that salvation came by the law of Moses, but the law of Moses did serve to strengthen their faith in Christ, and thus they did retain a, a hope through faith unto eternal salvation, relying upon the spirit of prophecy which spake of those things to come. Ultimately, exaltation is given by God's grace, as we prove our loyalty to him. Do these LDS scriptures say that we earn our way to heaven? If not, why would they be included in our modern day scriptures? Why wouldn't modern prophets or even Joseph Smith just edit them out? One may initially bring up Moroni 10.32 to claim that grace saves us only after we serve God with all our heart, might, mind, and strength. However, one need only read the next verse to see that Moroni clarifies this point by saying, Quote, and again, if ye by the grace of God are perfect in Christ, and deny not his power, then are ye sanctified in Christ by the grace of God, through the shedding of blood of the blood of Christ, which is in the covenant of the Father, unto the remission of your sins, that ye become holy. Again, reaffirming this idea that it is the grace of God that saves us, and that when we are not the, when we serve with all our heart, might, mind, and strength, that this is only just another way of saying that we are denying not His power, for, and that we are only sanctified in Christ and by the grace of God. It is not by anything that we do. Furthermore, regarding their assertion that we, as Latter Day Saints, believe that we can become a god or goddess of our own planet, I assert that this is this is a severe oversimplification of our beliefs. So here's what I think can be clearly said about this. We believe in a concept of exaltation, where we will become like God. Even so, claims about us getting our own planet are not like the scripture are not found in our scriptural canon. Many Latter-day Saints are partial to a belief in creative potential in the eternities in spite of that fact. And some leaders of the church have provided commentary as to what they believe that creative potential entails. So, for example, Spencer W. Kimball stated that we educate ourselves in the secular field and in the spiritual field so that we may one day create worlds, people, and, and govern them. However, with this in mind, church leaders have consistently leaned away from the idea that we get planets as some kind of reward for us and our posterity to live on. And I think that's where people get confused about the church's dialogue on this. This doctrine isn't the equivalent of God patting us on the back and giving us a lollipop at the end of a doctor's visit. Such sentiments of creating worlds reflect the idea that we are participating in the activities that God does. And they would need to demonstrate why that is a bad interpretation of the afterlife from using the biblical texts, or why this is even a problem. It's worth mentioning that many of the early church fathers believed in a concept of deification, and some Latter-day Saints have appealed to that. Uh, it is also worth noting that some differences exist between their concept of deification and ours, which chiefly had to do with how they viewed our relationship with God. That's a longer, more complicated discussion about how Greek philosophy and Christianity kind of mishmashed together. And one thing I do want to get across is that those discrepancies don't really pose a threat to LDS theology for a few different reasons, but mostly due to the idea that, most mostly due to the relationship that prophets have with scripture intertwined with the concept of modern revelation. So, why would it be a problem to believe in the LDS concept of deification in light of modern revelation? We don't believe that we will replace God any more than we believe that Jesus Christ replaces God the Father in our theology. The way I see it, they would need to demonstrate how this understanding of deification is incorrect after, of course, proving this idea that the Bible alone is the only source of information about God because they would need to do that in order to counteract my argument about modern revelation. The pamphlet continues, So the important question is this. How can we know this God? It's not about minor differences, musical style, color of carpet in church, or whether or not you drink coffee. It really, it's really a question of how we can be reconciled to God and have peace with him. 
And I would say that the we very clearly understand how we re are reconciled with God through Jesus Christ. That is what LDS scripture teaches. And that is what you leaders universally teach. So there is no contradiction there. But the pamphlet continues, The Bible says in Romans 3 that there is none righteous, no, not one. There are none who seek after God, that there is no fear of God before our eyes. Paul goes on to say that we are justified by faith alone, apart from works of law. He says that the law, in our inability to fulfill it, can only reveal our sin to us and shut our mouths before a holy God. In response to that, I'm going to assume that they're referring to the law of Moses, seeing as that's what Paul is referring to in his epistle to the Romans. And you can see the above stated, or the previously mentioned, uh, Book of Mormon scriptures about how the law doesn't save us, rather it is faith unto salvation. It is clear that the Book of Mormon and the Bible are united, at least in this regard. The only question to reconcile this point is what Paul meant here when he talked about faith. And we've talked about faith in previous episodes, I believe it was back in my episode about logical fallacies, but to recap, it's likely that being saved by faith doesn't mean that, that we are saved for just a mere intellectual acceptance of Jesus, but rather it is a loyalty that saves us, or, or a belief that leads to action. Note again, this is a linguistic and historical argument, not a theological one. This is me going off of the context of what Paul is talking about in Romans. And this is this idea I think is supported though by LDS and non-LDS scholars alike. And there are a plethora of sources you can go to that help talk about that. But think about how this interpretation resembles the LDS position on faith and salvation. Would anyone who affirms the idea that faith means faithfulness or loyalty be labeled as non-Christian according to these pastors who wrote this pamphlet? Would these pastors with equal ferocity label their fellow evangelical scholars as being non-Christian? Their pamphlet continues that since what Jesus says is true, and he said the wrath of God abides on us, how can we hope to have eternal life? My answer would be, through Jesus Christ. They can you say that our hope is in the gospel because of what he did, and I would wholeheartedly agree with that. I don't think that stands in any contradiction to Elias theology. Uh, the pamphlet then goes on to say that Jesus is the one true God in the flesh who went to the cross to take full punishment for his people. What they deserved, he took. He was buried, and he rose again. This was not so you could have his work in addition to your good works. And I would again refer to my previous comments about faith and loyalty. On top of that, the book of James seems to indicate that good works or actions are an important aspect of faith. It reads, quote, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say that you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of them says, one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. So my question is, how should we understand these verses? Is there any conflict here between what I've demonstrated about the LDS concept of faith and what's discussed, what's discussed in the book of James? We can keep going, though. Uh, the, the pamphlet continues, The Bible says that our good works are nothing but filthy rags to God. Consider this. Galatians 5 tells us that we are severed from Christ if we seek to be justified by the law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no man may boast. And again, as stated previously, the Book of Mormon teaches the same thing. The church just holds a deeper understanding of faith thanks to our historical context and modern revelation. The pamphlet tries to make the comparison to the to our supposed you know, teaching. They quote 2 Nephi 25-23, For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. And we've talked about this verse already back in my Logical Fallacies video, but again, to recap, after all you can do likely means in spite of all we do. And you can read more about this claim in, in some of the resources I provide. It's basically say, the same way we use the phrase, after all I've done. If, if I was to say, can you forgive me after all I've done? I'm not asking for forgiveness because of what I've done, rather, 
I'm asking for forgiveness in spite of what I've done. And I think that when we look at this fra this phrase here, both when we put it in the context of how Joseph Smith would have used it to translate, and also in the linguistic example I just provided, I think it more easily shows what this verse is trying to say. The pamphlet concludes in the following way. The beauty and freedom found in the gospel is this. Christ became a curse to his people. There is no work that you can do to help establish your own righteousness. Galatians 3 actually tells us that if you try to establish that righteousness for yourself, the law will become a curse to you. But instead, Christ became a curse for God's people by taking the punishment they deserved and giving them a righteousness that is not their own. I would say that the beauty of the restored gospel is that Jesus saves us. And we can understand and strengthen our faithful relationship with Jesus Christ in a more profound way thanks to modern scripture and divine revelation. We can have an assurance of our good standing with God. Jesus Christ is the way to return to the Father. On top of that, we continue to receive modern revelation from chosen messengers of God who provide increased light insight into what he wants for us today. I understand where they're coming from, but I reject their position because to do otherwise would be to reject the truths that God has revealed today. The heavens are opened and the Lord God Almighty speaks. He lives and he guides his people. And I think I speak for most, if not all of us, when I say that we want them and all people to come and see this miracle for yourselves. Come and see the church. We appreciate, or at least try to appreciate what we have to offer. If you refuse to do so, we will respect your decision. But I will cordially ask that they cease their unwarranted assault on the true and living church of God. Now, I don't know if anyone from Apologia Church will care to watch this, and if they are, I want to reinforce this idea that I'm trying to act in good faith here. I'm not deliberately trying to mislead, and I'm willing to engage with you on this. If you have questions, or I, I urge you to reach out to me so we can have further discussion, I am more than happy to make edits to my article, revise my position, and even delete things that I that you can unequivocally prove to my, that my position is wrong. I want to be open-minded, and I want to listen. Even so, I think that the points I presented here pose a serious problem for the conclusions that they're trying to present. And I plead with them, the, those members and pastors of Apology Church, to not dismiss them offhand. As for everyone else, I would, can, I would hope that you consider the principles I employed from the previous videos in the series to help me arrive at my conclusions. What questions did I ask? How did I evaluate my sources? What logical arguments did I present? What misinformation did I try to correct? What epistemic sources did I pull from? Right. If you look hard enough, you will be able to see my methodology, and you can decide for yourself whether you find my points to be convincing or not. As you do so, I hope you're able to recognize how by asking these questions, we can become the kinds of thinkers and believers God wants us to be. And that's where I am going to leave off with one final note. For the next little while, this is going to be the last episode of the series. There are a couple of reasons for this, but it mostly boils down to the idea that Fair is going to be having me do a couple of other things for the upcoming year in terms of Come Follow Me and addressing Book of Mormon discussions. But I want to leave a couple of parting thoughts. First, I urge everyone to, who, who cares to listen to please continue to love freely and do good continually. If I've made mistakes, they are the mistakes of men, and I, I would hate to have anything that I have said cause any kind of distance between the relationships that we hold dear in our lives or the, our relationship with God. 
And I hope that as we continue to try and use these critical thinking skills we've tried to review, that we're able to find ways to build close connections with God and with others. Continue to be the best kinds of people I know we all can be. Second, I would like to give my... I, I would just like to say thank you. I, I've certainly appreciated the support that I've gotten. Can you come I know that there's a lot more that can be said, and I hope that you continue to study, but thank you for allowing me to talk to you about this, for giving me your time. I certainly appreciate the support I've gotten from all of you, and I certainly hope that this has been helpful in trying to foster a better relationship with our Heavenly Father. So again, thank you for everything, and be sure to have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you.